Imagine this. Okay. There's a bed. A blanket. It's an uh, old blanket. It's a blanket like like you know that that your great 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 grandmother like stitched. Mm. And it had all these parts on it. Mm. And it had a bit of, you know, and one of those kind of patches represented uh, truth. And one of them represented courage. And one of them represented dishonesty. One of them represented uh, wealth. One of them represented poverty. One of them represented famine. One of them represented nuclear uh, entanglement. One of them represented um, barbed wire. One of them represented California fires. One of them represented um, peace on earth, at least the way we thought about it, say, in the 60s. And one of them represented disillusionment. And you took all of those and you stitched them all together. And you wrapped yourself in the blanket. And then you went to sleep. Chapter one. So, are you moral all the time? That's a very good question. Am I moral all the time? Are any of us moral all the time? You know, we like, I think, you know, we like empathy, correct? Mm -hmm. We like the idea of empathy. Mm Mm-hmm. And uh, I was listening to this uh, Hidden Brain, NPR. (gasps) NPR, it's a government lefty conspiracy. (laughs) Take your guns to the pizza shop. (laughs) Child porn, pedophile ring. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, Hillary Clinton was um, broadcasting this show from the caves under the pizza shop. And it was all about, like, empathy, you know, and how do people feel, Do you know, feeling empathy. And uh, do we always, do we always, you know, feel the same feeling of empathy all the time? Or do we always feel... Um, you know, they did this study where they put football soccer fans of uh, Manchester United in this study, and then they they went out from the study and they had they're, they're like a guy. It was a s- setup. They had somebody like fall who was wearing a Manchester United shirt, and they like fell on the ground. And like the guy when the guys were passing, and they like helped them up. And then they did, you know, then they tried it where like they were wearing a jersey of the other of like the other team, like the hated rival. And what it, how did they react? And then they were wearing a jersey with no marking, you know, and how did they react? And and it does make you wonder, you know, how all of us r- react in the world based on our based on things. Do we do we are we um, is our empathy uh, with others? Is it is it even or does it fl- is it fluctuate? You know, is it convenient? Yeah. Uh, that that was an interesting question, mm. you know. Yeah. Yeah, we like to think of ourselves as, you know, certainly on the left, we want to think that we are morally, you know, on the right side. Right. Uh, but But the thing is, on the other side, for some of the people on the other side, I think it's morally correct to keep all those blacks and Hispanics and Jews and... Muslims away because that's the right thing to do. Hmm. Even if it's not said that way? Yeah, actually, people don't want to say it that way. They imply it. They hint at it. They walk around it. But that's what they're saying. If you look at it, and there are enough people who believe that to... um, to make it so that uh, that that becomes like a whole reality. There's like a whole community of people who actually believe that. I mean, I was being satirical, but imagine 
a country with nuclear arsenals and a huge military with like 40% of the population who actually would be okay with that or would vote mm. to empower someone who is pushing that in order to get a peach for a pie or 50%. Here, here's 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 brilliant um, politicking, making your side believe, showing your side like, oh, you know the, the, the violence in the streets that's happening, whether or not it's happening right now, painting it as if there's violence in the street, and saying this is what America would look like under Joe Biden, when in fact it's the story they're painting is happening right now under. <laughs> Donald Trump. Mm. It's brilliant. It's, it's absolutely brilliant. brilliant. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, imagine this this America. Like, well, uh, you mean like we're all, you know, we have almost 200,000 deaths from COVID and and uh, there's a lot, there is unrest in, in the streets. Imagine that America. Yeah. And, uh, oh, oh, wait, no, that's Trump's America. Right. So I, I, you have reality, but what Trump's reality is, is the imagination. The imagination just seems to have the upper hand on the left and on the right. If you can imagine... The imagination. Yeah, whatever mm. you imagine. It's so much more exciting than reality. Mm-hmm. Imagine if. Imagine this. Imagine, uh -huh. imagine right. that. Imagine right. if America was run by... Imagine the future... Imagine all right. these scary people coming to get you. Imagine evil things that will befall you. Imagine, and I'm applying this perhaps to the both extremes. Imagine if we could rid ourselves of the evil thinking. Imagine young people going out to vote. Imagine all the young people. Yeah, honestly, I hope um, everybody votes in the country. That's what I'm imagining. It's not going to happen. I'm sorry. I would love for which which country? <laughs> Did you say Vanuatu? <laughs> I would love it if the entire country voted. That's what I like to imagine. Right? I mean, that's our. What would happen, this is going to sound crazy, what would happen if people voted and one person got into power, but the system was set up so that even if the majority of people voted this way, the other person would become the, the, the leader? No, that's ridiculous. You wouldn't. That doesn't make any no, sense. Just imagine and, that. You, imagine that. Yeah, but I mean, you wouldn't have that because, and then imagine then that you go and try to teach other people. No, no, no. I'm not about talking about a system. civilized country, Eric. I'm just saying, <laughs> imagine that happening somewhere. That would never happen, because you know, no. you can imagine where you then you're you're trying to teach other countries about how wonderful this system is where, you know, you vote and then, you know, most votes create a, a leader and, um, and then, but then we, that, whatever, that imaginary country doesn't actually have that system in place themselves. Right. Cause you know, imagine that. Yeah. 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 I mean, just, just imagine, I'm not even talking about a few hundred votes or a few thousand votes. This is really preposterous. Imagine one person gets millions, millions, millions of more votes. Like and they, three million. Let's say three no, million. No, that's ridiculous. But just say uh, millions. It's ridiculous. No, no, okay. let's, not, let's not take it to extremes because then you lose right. your ability to persuade. Yeah, I mean, that's the oldest trick right. in the book. So just tone it down okay. a bit, Eric. Okay. Not okay. three million. Come on. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Didn't you take okay. podcasting 101? Uh, for goodness sake. So, but let's say a lot, a lot, a lot. What then? I mean, what then? Uh, if we're to be the bright shining beacon of democracy around the world, um, maybe we, ah, oh, I got a better idea. Rather than the, 
being, the bright shining beacon of light around the world for billions of people. Why don't we be like a dark hole underneath a pizza shop where people make shit up and then Mm. bring their AK-47s and scare the the living heck out of people who are law-abiding citizens? Why don't we be that instead? Chapter 2. So um, here we are again, and we uh, had such a great talk with Eric Olson, and we're going to continue that conversation today. Um, Eric Olson, who is uh, just an amazing individual, um, as I said in the last episode, he's active in um, politics at uh, City County University and uh, and the national level um, now with this book that we've been discussing, which is... Endgame, Inside the Impeachment of Donald J. Trump by Eric Swalwell. So we're going to pick up the conversation uh, where we left off in the last episode and uh, hope you enjoy. I found the contrast in reading this book between the insane amount of corruption and veneer, as you were just saying, uh, the superficiality of the media or parts of the media um, and the whole executive or much of the executive branch, um, as contrasted with Eric and people who were like Eric, who, uh, were diligent, hardworking, had a, a sense of morality. And one of the things that really stood out for me, uh, which may bode well for, um, Eric Swalwell for a possible, Uh, run for presidency again, is that he seems to have a natural propensity to reach out to the other side. Um, There's this northern, I mean, I've spent a lot of time in California. I I know California. There's this northern California element to him, Mm -hmm. but there's also this Midwest Mm -hmm. um, natural strong guy um, who, you know, he's very, very down earth and he's very happy just to go up to someone on the other side, his political opponents, if you will, at the gym or right. walking somewhere and say, Hey, yo, right. uh, you know, Matt Gates or, or Jim Jordan, right. or, you know, some of these, right. um, some might characterize them as, uh, Actually, I, I don't even want to use words. Just right, someone right. other, right. So, someone right. other, Very and he important. would, yeah, and he would yeah. just say, "Hey, how are you doing? No, right. Yo, right. how's it going?" And he'd get in a conversation, whether they would engage with him or not. That's kind of up to them. But he seems right. open to that, and I think, I think that that maybe I'm referring to at least what I I think you were saying before, Eric, about his authenticity. I think. I think that people see that this guy's heart is bigger than just, you know, you can't, he's going to be hard to label as just some, uh, some, you know, to the left liberal guy. I think, I think he's bigger than that. He is. Yeah, no, I, I think you, you've, you've really hit on something there, Mark. Um, I mean, yeah, Eric is a very, um, uh, he cares about people. He's a people person, right? And and uh, he's going to work with people um, to get things done. And you know, he does have friends across the aisle, uh, um, and and that's important. Um, I mean, they can go and do battle, you know, uh, day in and day out, but it doesn't mean that you have to, um, you know, hate the person, <laughs> you know, uh, on the other side. And um, and he, I mean, I think, and this comes through in the book as well, you know, his parents are both Republicans. Right. Um, and, you know, he, he grew up with a lot. Of, and his best friend actually uh, ended up being the speechwriter for George W. Bush, um, right. which is crazy. I mean, like, right. it, it, it's just crazy. That they, and they're still best friends. And they're still, they are best friends. They are, right. They're legitimately best friends. And I met him 20 years ago, and they were best friends. And, um and I think that that's that's something that we, you know, I, I don't know, I've read something recently how, um, you know, if you live in a neighborhood, um, 
chances are that you know, you know, the majority of your neighborhood, you know, the vast majority of your neighborhood is going to share your political views. You know, and you know, you get another neighborhood somewhere else, and it's going to be the opposite political views. But it, so we've become much more segmented, uh, even where we live, right? Absolutely. Um, and um, I think that where you know Eric grew up. It, you know, you had a diversity of opinions. Um, and he also, it's funny, and in, in the book he says this, how he didn't really come to his um, political, you know, uh, coming of age uh, until later. I mean, it seems like he, you know, he didn't, maybe when, you know, he was a soccer player, he, he cared about soccer, you know, he was in high school. Um, I mean, he was a good student, but, you know, maybe didn't quite get into government politics as much as later. And, you know, I think he, you know, like a lot of people, they, you know, what their family believes, you know, you take that on. Right. Um, but I think, you know, one of his lines is, uh, you know, I've been reaching across the dinner table, you know, my whole life. <laughs> right? That's um, right. And so it's, it's hard to, you know, for someone who's um, always had, you know, a particular political viewpoint, um, and doesn't know anyone else who's ever had another political viewpoint, um, it's hard to imagine, it may be hard to imagine um, how you could possibly be friends with someone who doesn't share your viewpoint. And yet, for generations, that's how, well, that's how it should be. You should be, you should, should be. know people uh, who have different thoughts and opinions. Um, and I think he's, I think he's kind of holding that standard by doing those things, by writing about it, by going right. on Fox, by talking to Tucker Carlson, Absolutely. Yep. by yep. saying, this is what we're supposed to do. I'm supposed That's to right. go in here and, and debate this and, right. and, and, and go in there. Like, I love that he kind of held the line on what was like, how much time they were going to have and how much they were going to talk about. And then there was some compromise, but you know, that, that he, he's, he's showing that I'm going to, he's a real player and I'm going to have, but we're going to have a discussion, but it's going to be about ideas. It's not going to be about, you know, you know, flash and, or, you know, gotcha. And then two minutes or, you know, five minute discussion or, you know, it's like, we're going to discuss substance. Right. Right. And, uh, that's right. And, and, but we're on different sides of the aisle, clearly. Right. 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 So, yeah. And, and with his best friend, I mean, they would debate and they continue to debate to this day, but doesn't mean that they don't, they're not friends and don't love each other. And, you know, I mean, it's, they're, they're friends They're but, you can have a healthy debate about those things. And, and so it's, um, that's really important. I mean, that's, a, that's, that's a very important point in all this. And, uh, you know, there was also the other stories of like going on, you know, the congressional delegation trips to, you know, Antarctica oh, yeah. or wherever, oh. uh, and, you know, ending up, you know, scuba diving with, uh, I forget, it was, I don't think it was Nunez, but was it was one of Pompeo or no, that was another trip. He was with Pompeo, but, um, anyway, one, one of the other, one of the other, um, right. How valuable a trip he'll, like that was. And, the, and, but like how, everyone yeah. else stayed in the hotel and they were like, well, let's go scuba diving, you know? And then, right. and then he had this rare earths, ele- rare earth elements bill, um, That's right. Made him, you know, I won't do justice to the subject, but it was about you know trade and about you know uh, all the rare earth elements that go into all this high tech stuff. And you know, he worked with the chairman of the um, or the ranking member. I guess at the time it was the chairman, so it was Republican chairman Lamar Smith of the Science Committee, um, to get this bill passed. And then the Club for Growth, which is an arch conservative uh, group, you know, basically killed it. But but he was working with Republicans as well as Democrats to get that passed. And, you know, some stuck with him and some some did not. I think it's important. And I uh, I would summarize my feelings about Endgame inside the impeachment of Donald J. Trump by Eric Swalwell with it's really a dark story about a dark section of American history where the bad guy squeaks by and sort of wins. But the hope that comes through the pages is Eric Swalwell's reaching out and 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 just as you you both were describing him being on Fox News and him working with people from the other side and and talking to them and hanging out. I I personally 
found that to bring me a, a, a sense of hope. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's good. That's good. That's right. I mean, um, and that's how it should be. I mean, as you say, you know, dark, the, the, the villain or whatever, you know, won in the end, although it's still a chapter, right? I mean, the history is still being written. And uh, I think that all that work that was done over the past year doesn't mean that it's all gone for naught, you know? Right. Um, right. There's a lot of, um, I don't think we're seeing the end to all of what we've, you know, what was unearthed and what maybe hasn't been unearthed yet. Um and, you know, we have an election coming up, so um, we'll see what happens there. Chapter three. So, Eric, you and I have a, a songwriting relationship. Yes, and, we do. you know, on these, on, these, on these Take Me For A Ride podcasts, we, we always have a song. And I thought uh, we'd um, I'd play a tune that you and I wrote together because you're a wonderful lyricist. And, um, and we wrote this tune... Uh, up in Gettysburg, and uh, it's called the Three O'clock Parade, and uh, I, 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 I think it's an interesting and actually relevant tune to what we're talking about. Um, it's completely relevant. Yes, it's, it, it is. It is. It's um, a yeah. No, it's amazing working with you on on, on the songs, you know, and and uh, that relationship is is amazing um, to be able to convey through words and music, you know, stories and right. stories. A lot of these, a lot of the stories are about sort of America and different aspects of the U S and our history and our, our present and our past and our families and our hopes and our dreams. Right. And right. some of the things that are, you know, tragic as well. Um, right. right. That, that need to be addressed. Um, but right. uh, but this one's one of my one of my one of my favorites of, of ours. Um, right, right. And uh, you know speaks to a small town that uh, I spent an awful lot of time in, and uh, like many places across the Rust Belt, um, you know the the mill shut down, and you know a lot of people in that town worked at that mill. So so I'll can I sing it, and then we'll talk a little more. Please, please, right. yeah. Afternoons we'd go there, my grandparents' place. Grandpa walked the three blocks home with a lunch pail at a leisurely pace. A couple of kids' anticipation and a smile on our face. Drinking Cokes from glass bottles, we got at the service station. And on the porch when the mill We'd hug Grandpa and we'd wave And pick up trucks and muscle cars The three o'clock parade They'd honk their horns and gun the motor In the home of the brave What a thrill every afternoon The three o'clock parade Last of the vets who fought in World War II Winding down their working years They were hell of a crew Working right beside them Younger women and men High school graduation A paycheck and a pension And everybody in that mill a nickname Moosey Bobo Dougie each had a claim to fame like a big old family on the floor of that workplace there were marriages and breakups lunch with Jack Queen King and A.
gold watch 1979 65 years old the whistle blew at quitting time you go out at three o'clock see the old gang drive by they'd yell and rev their engines just like the old times a car pulled in the drive in 1982 they're closing down the mill dab what the hell we gonna When the mill let out We'd hug Grandpa and we'd wave We'd pick up trucks and muscle cars The three o'clock parade They'd honk their horns and gun the motor In the home of the brave What a thrill every afternoon The three o'clock parade What a thrill Beautiful. Beautiful. Great. Thanks for what saying that. Beautiful song. Great, My great gosh. words, man. Yeah, that was that was a real trip to write that. I remember when we t- just finished it. That there was yeah. a moment it was like done, and we both there was a, both a, a feeling of mm. you know having told a story yep. uh, with the music and the words, and um, you know, and I think it's interesting that my great grandfather worked in a mill in Louisiana. You know, and so my mom heard that song and was very, t- I was very touched by it. And my mom heard it was really touched. And obviously, you know, your grandfather and, and um, you know, that's an era that is yep. largely no more. And I think that, you know, you're, you're, you're touching on the, and the way we wrote it into the song, that moment where in 1982, when they're closing down the mills, what the hell are we going to do is really a powerful, powerful statement and it made me think. Uh, it made me think of uh, Mark and I. Both read the book "Educated" by Tara Westover, amazing book. And and she talks about uh, in an interview. She talked about going back to her hometown, and and uh, you know, it, the hometown's all boarded up. You know, Main yeah. Street is boarded up. And, uh, and, and she was saying this in the in the context of how people are voting now. And uh, right. anyways, that's just kind of something that I. I I think that sometimes people in cities and in university towns can't understand, right. can't be so aware of or so sensitive to what a right. lot of Americans, people around the world, but, you know, speaking for yeah. our country, a lot of Americans are going through in terms it's of losing. Of, yeah. Yeah. It's a lot of pain out there. Yeah. You know, it's a lot of loss, right? Um, there's a lot of economic insecurity. And when that happens, People, people can do a variety of things, right? And um, I mean, you know, you don't want to paint too rosy of a picture, but you know, people had a job and people were employed and they worked together and their families worked together. They, they went to school together. I mean, that's community. And they and 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 I think in a sense, we're losing community, you know, in this country broadly. And our job is to build community. And right. um, you know, it, it starts with economics and, you know, jobs and schools and all that, right? Yep. And um, courage. And courage. And, and yeah. poets, and musicians. <laughs> yeah. Right. One of my favorite bits of this song is how the regular folks are the heroes of the parade. It's not right. the charismatic yeah. business guy with the fancy suit or the right. you know the right. Corvette pulls up. It's it's Grandpa and it's just the Main Street America. These are the heroes, and I so love that. Mm. Mm. Thanks for uh, pointing that out or you know bringing that out. 
It's true. I mean, look, I was, you know, the, every word of that's true, right? I mean, it was a, you know, I, I don't know if it was at three o'clock, but it seemed like three o'clock, you know, when I was a little kid and the the mill, the shift let out and it was just this stream of car, you know, muscle cars and, and pickup trucks. I mean, mm. going home for the day and, you know, we'd be out on the porch and Mm. I'd ask my you know, grandpa, well, who's that? Well, that's so-and-so. And well, what's their story? Well, they live up on the hill. And, oh, well, who, who's that? Oh, well, they're, that, that's the brother of so-and-so. And, you know, and, and you'd wave to them. You know, little kid, you're out there, you wave to them. And they're honking the horns. And, you know, it, it was a parade. I mean, that's exactly what it was. I mean, it was it, they were excited to go home for the day. And it was, like, boisterous. And the engines were going. I mean... They were, I mean, some of those muscle cars, you know, they just, it was a, it was a thing of beauty, you know? <laughs> mm. It's funny because just now for the first time, I've really pondered what it means when you say the term folk music. So I grew up yeah. loving folk music and right. Paul Simon and all sorts of things like right. that. Well, it just occurred to me just now that it's music about folks <laughs> yeah. and in that sense yeah. those are the heroes those are the mythological heroes in that sense you eric and eric um just have to change my name here to fit in um <laughs> you're in the tradition of woody guthrie and uh pete seeger uh this land is your land this it's it's bringing the common everyday person um whether they're red or blue states, it doesn't matter. Right. Uh, the workers, um, the, the people working the earth, uh, the people building things, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's bringing them into light and allowing them the space to have their own parade. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Yeah, yeah. They are the heroes, right? I mean, they're the same people that were on the volunteer fire department you know they were the same people that played softball you know down at the ballpark you know in town they were the same people that um every one of them had a story i mean everyone had a nickname right yep. they all had a nickname i mean it was it was kind of crazy like it but that's that tells you that there was a community right um right and i'm i'm thinking of the 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 thought that you, you can't hate people that you know right and um or it's hard to at least or you know i don't like to use the word hate but you know that that when you know people and and i think that's what um the current climate i think is making people forget that like you know if you know people if you know them you're going to feel differently right and it's just the importance of of knowing and when i'm hearing the story you know when i'm singing this story uh, the words you wrote it's like it doesn't matter who their someone's political leanings it's like they're the heroes in the story and and you're knowing them and you're uh and you're you're hearing that it's an earnest telling you know uh right so well and they were also you know all doing their part right yeah. i mean when you're in a mill this person's doing this job this person's doing this job you rely on the the person before you and after you and you rely on, and my grandfather was a shipping clerk, so he shipped the stuff out, you know, but you rely on everybody else. It's a team, right? Um, and, you know, as a lot of those men and, and women, there were women who worked there too. I mean, but a lot of the guys there were, they were vets, they were veterans, you know, World War II, right? Right. And that's in the, in the song, but it, you know, I think there was that common purpose, right? I mean, you, when you, when you go off and fight the Nazis, you know, um, again, the political, you know, your political leanings, uh, I don't know that it mattered as much because as long as, you know, everyone knew they loved their country and everyone knew they loved their town and, you know, they worked together. Right. Um, so right. there was a common purpose and a common interest you know that they had when they were young and then they, they grew up with that right powerful 
powerful. I will just say that uh, listening to that song uh, reminded me of a bicycle trip I took, me being an East Coast, West Coast elite snob, <laughs> overeducated. <laughs> looked, I looked down at everybody. Uh, that's just because I'm tall. Um, and I bicycled across the United States uh, going the wrong way. I went against the headwinds back in 1986. Mm. And I went across the flyover states. I went through the, the, blue, the red states. And I went into enemy territory. And never did I find a nicer group of people. Mm -hmm. Yep. I believe it. And yeah, your song, Eric's, really took me back there uh, through St. Ignace, Michigan, and mm -hmm. places like that where uh, my bicycle broke mm -hmm. and I was pulling a trailer that my puppy, Siberian Husky puppy was in. Mm -hmm. And all my stuff was strewn across a field and the dog was upset and I was upset and this police officer pulls up and his lights are flashing. I'm thinking, uh-oh. And he comes over to me. He says, I'm going to help you with your bicycle. And <laughs> he fixes the bicycle. He finds me a place to stay. And next day he's fixes, he's welding the, the trailer. And then he mm -hmm. takes out a rag and he starts polishing the bicycle. I say, Officer Brown, <laughs> you don't have to do that. And he says, I'll never forget it. And these, this is someone right out of your song. He said, son, when you do a job, you do it right. Mm. Wow. Wow. I don't know if the guy voted red or blue. The, yep. 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 Officer Brown, thank you. Mm -hmm. Chapter four. Look, look, Eric, all I'm saying is Mr. Peach went to Washington. I mean, you went on this whole rant about something. I don't know what. I'm just saying that he went to you Washington. Sub huh? You <laughs> something happened on the way to Mr. Smith. <laughs> it was a Mr. Smith's apple. And he got he said a, a apple pie for a peach, a peach for a pie, a peach for a pie. I don't know why. Anyway, that that's the whole scenario you're you're talking about is utter uh peach fuzz. It's absurd. No, uh, if you want to hear the utter one, I'll tell you about Mu Yu. Now, I almost <laughs> went to a cow college, and it was University of Maine in Orono. I, 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 this is something only Mr. Peach knows about me. I it's used utterly to, hilarious. It's utterly. Uh, uh, you want to hear the utter one? So the I used to I used to be I had this power. I don't have it anymore, as you could tell. But I used to have this power, and the power was this. When I was like 15 years old, I was living in New York City. I went off to southern New Hampshire and worked on a farm. And I developed. I developed through hard work and perseverance. I developed the ability, the power, the raw power to be able to moo and 50 cows in the next field would stand up and shit in unison. Oh, stop. Duh. No, no, no. You think I'm Come joking. Come on. No, no, no. And I'm going to try it right now. Are you sitting down? Oh, God. So you got some TP right Don't there? Don't do it. <laughs> okay, because it works on humans too. You ready? Oh, no. Oh, no. How you feel? I got... I got to chill up my spine. Oh, it didn't go far. It didn't go low enough. Damn. <laughs> All right. I'll keep at it, man. Because in this world, whether you and Mr. Peach go to, go to Washington or not, you need spine. You need spine to have... Wine. Wine? Yes. I guess that's kind of like what you're saying. It's about divine. Courage, huh? Yeah. It's just... Like, divine. It's courage divine is courage. Divine. Courage is divine. Without courage... We are mush. If we're mush, we're just much too much like Mr. Peach. I don't be. I don't mind being like Mr. Peach. I just don't want my uh, 
my country and my children seeing this um, spineless uh, lack of courage kind of behavior and uh, thinking, oh, that's what people do. That's what adults do. Because it's not. It's not. You know, look at the people with courage and I'm talking, you know, look at the, look at the, uh, y- Yovanovich's and Vindman's and look at the David Blaine's and the, the Luke Aikens, the guy that jumped out of the airplane at 25,000 feet without a parachute. Look at, um, you know, the authors, the artists, the people that are, that are doing things uh, courageously and speaking out. That's the, that's the leadership we need in this country. And uh, yes, look at John Bolton. He had the courage to wait (laughs) in presenting the truth about what he knew as an insider so that he could make like, I think it was like $2 million from some publisher or other. Um, now, is that the courage you're talking about? Is that the kind of person we should vote for, John Bolton? Come on, shake your head yes, because I really like his glasses and that walrus look. <laughs> come on, come on. <laughs> go ahead. Okay, but, but, good, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. <laughs> no. Uh, no, you see, your glasses don't do it. I would never vote for you. you need- $2 million. Yeah, so that's the courage that that I think we should be pushing, is the kind of courage that is... Like, if you take the words, this is like words have no meaning. You see this going back to deconstruction. If you take the word courage, it's just like what I was saying. Mr. Peach, he goes to Washington, he meets Mr. Courage and Mr. Corruption. The problem mm. is they get in a taxi and it's, you know, they're sort of wearing chocolate and it's warm. <laughs> and so they sort of melt and meld and mush and they get too close the courage and the corruption and there's not much left to pay the taxi fare because they're all kind of drippy and mushy and saucy and that chocolate was used on the pie for the peach peach for a pie, peach for a pie it's actually kind of tasty I don't want to that's I don't want that to be uh, too appealing. Kind it of is appealing. That's my whole point. That's why I came here. I should be, I should be asleep. I'm really tired, and here we are, like blah 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 blah. And but I came out here because I wanted to tell you it is appealing. A peach is appealing. How do you think you get to the inner parts of it? The times are a changing. The peaches are appealing. As the times they're changing.